Well, this morning, we are continuing to plod through Romans 12, and that's what it is. It is a plod, <laughs> one verse at a time. And so we are at Romans 12:12. 12, 12. And so we direct your attention to the Holy Word of God in Romans 12. This is the word of the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Hello? There we go. So yeah, like I said, it'll be a quick applause. So uh, I'll be moving quick. So you have to listen quick and then uh, apply it quick <laughs> to our lives. That's our prayer. But uh, R.C. Sproul said uh, that the Christian life can basically be reduced to three dimensions. And we're going to see those three dimensions here in our text today. The first dimension is joy and, and, and hope. That verse said that the first three words, rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope, Romans 12, 12 says. Now, this idea of rejoicing, this idea of joy, this idea of exuberance and, and uh, just a, a, a adulation, uh, it's, it's one of the main attributes, right, uh, for, for the Christian life. As a matter of fact, uh, in Galatians, Paul says that it's the, one of the fruit of the Spirit. And that's interesting. We're going to talk about that quite a, quite a few times here today because the fact that joy is listed as a fruit of the Spirit should imply something to us. It should imply that joy is not natural, biblical joy, because it's a fruit of the Spirit. That means, see, the fruit of the Spirit means something that only the Spirit can bear in us. The Spirit can make this happen. So without the Spirit, we can't do it. So keep that in mind as we talk about joy and what biblical joy is. Well, joy, biblical joy is a fruit of the Spirit. But then Philippians 4.4 4 gives us this. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now that is a command. You say, what? Yes, that, that's an imperative. Paul's saying, I'm commanding you, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. So we are commanded to rejoice, but also it's something that we can't do without the Holy Spirit. And by the way, I think, I, I, I hope anyway that you as a Christian have learned that everything God commands us to do he equips us to do by his spirit. That, that's something we've got to realize as Christians. This is, this is the greatest safeguard against legalism. Every command that God commands of us, he equips us to do by his spirit. We never do it in our flesh. We can't do it in our flesh. So having said that, we see this, this, this command to, to rejoice, and we are to re, re, be joyful people. As a matter of fact, it's, it's one of the fruit of the spirit. So Christians should be known as joyful people. It's a command. However, what is this biblical joy? Real quick, three things that biblical joy is not. Biblical joy that we're talking about here is, is not a matter of personality or temperament. We, miss, we touched on this last week. All of us have different personalities. All of us have different temperament. So, right, some are naturally cheery and optimistic. And others are a little melancholy, a little pessimistic, right? It's, and it's the nature. It's just by, by temperament and personality. And, and so that, we cannot confuse joy with, with personalities because the optimist and the pessimist are both commanded to be joyful and to rejoice. And so joy... Again, I guess the, the, the illustration of this personality thing, right, to show that it's just innate in some people, right? We, we just have this personality, either we're melancholy. And it's funny, it's really great to watch the melancholy um, pessimist try to be joyful in, <laughs> and, and to, to make it happen on their own. Just like it's crazy to watch those cheery guys be very serious and calm. And that's all I got. That's all I can be. That's as long as I can be calm right there, because I'm one of those cheery guys, I think. But it just reminds me of this story. I can't help but tell it. I'm going to tell it. Just the, the, you know, the, the scientists, they saw these twins. They were born, and one of those twins just had that cheery disposition, that personality that said, I just can see the good in everything. I'm always happy, always happy, 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 always joyful, optimistic. And then his twin, 
identical twin was always pessimistic, always negative, always looking at the, the world uh, with dark colored glasses. So they said, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to change these guys. We're going we're to put that, pessim that, that pessimistic negative kid in a room full of great things, cake and toys and fun things. And he's going to be happy. So they locked this kid in that room, look in the window, check on him. They took his twin brother and they put him in a room, the happy guy. The guy that saw everything is just always great, always wonderful, right? And they put him in a room, waist high, in horse manure and shut the door. Well, they go back to check on the first brother, who should be just so happy right now, the one who's always negative, but now he should be happy because he's in a room full of all good stuff. And they look in that door, and he is sitting there complaining, I don't like chocolate cake, I don't like this toy, and I don't like the color of this, and no, 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 it's too hot in here, blah, 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 blah. So they seal that door up. He's staying there for We're not letting this kid out. I'm kidding. But it just, no hope. No hope for that guy. Then they go to the other room where this kid is always happy and optimistic and joyful. And they think, surely he's calmed down a bit. He cannot be happy. They look in the window to see this kid jumping up, hooting and hollering, having the best time, jumping up and down, diving in and out, all over this stuff. They don't understand. They open the door and say, what is wrong with you? He said, man, I got to tell you, with all this horse manure, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> now, having said that, there are some people that naturally have that personality, right? They're, that doesn't mean they're Christians. Doesn't mean they're not. You see what I'm saying? Same with the melancholy and more pessimistic. That doesn't mean you're a Christian. It doesn't mean you're not. That's just personality, Okay. The command to be joyful applies to both. And it doesn't mean that because you're joyful, you have to all of a sudden change your disposition. Because biblical joy is not a matter of personality or temperament. Secondly, biblical joy is not a matter of pleasant circumstances. Kind of what we've already talked about. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Paul wrote the book of Philippians, which is all about joy, one of the most joyful books in the New Testament, the book of Philippians, and he wrote that from a prison cell. So joy, biblical joy, does not depend upon your circumstances being happy or good or favorable or pleasant. And then finally, biblical joy is not a fake, phony, superficial smile on the outside while you're hurting on the inside. Biblical joy is not a grin and bear it kind of thing. We've been studying this in Sunday school, the one another's. The Christian life is a life to be shared. And part of that, Paul will talk about in verse 15 when we get there in a few weeks, uh, Romans 12, 15. He, he tells us there's a time to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. So biblical joy is not saying that I have to have constantly this phony smile on my face all the time, even when I'm hurting on the inside. No, when you're hurting on the inside, your brothers and sisters should be also hurting with you. There's a time to weep. And yes, there's a time to rejoice outwardly, but none of that has to do with biblical joy. None of that takes away biblical joy. You, you, you will see biblical joy at the funeral of a believing mom and dad as they're looking at the very small coffin of their baby. There will not be exuberant happiness and jovial jumping up and down, nothing like that. But there will be a joy in the truth of God's promises. A joy that gets them through, even in the midst of pain, and even though they're not smiling. That's the idea of biblical joy. What is this biblical joy? Here it is. Paul's going to give it to us. So if biblical, if, if biblical joy is not just smiling on the outside, happy all the time, my personality and all my circumstances are great, what is biblical joy? He says it right there in verse 12 again. Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. In hope, not in your circumstances, not because of your personality. No, you rejoice in hope. 
Now, this biblical joy is anchored in biblical hope. That's one way to remember that. Biblical joy is anchored in biblical hope. What do I mean by that? That the word el, el peace in the New Testament for, for hope is different than our word hope in English. We're not talking about an earthly, I hope so, but I doubt it. That's kind of what we mean by hope. I, I hope. We, we, our, our word hope in the English is synonymous with our word wish. And to wish is to long for something that probably will not happen. That's the definition. Look it up. <laughs> What's the definition of wish? To long for something and to want something that most probably will not happen. Well, that's kind of a sad beginning. If that's where I'm starting from, from, from saying, oh, this will never happen, but that's not the kind of hope that the Bible's talking about. That word, el peace, the definition literally is an absolute certainty a confident expectation of what is to come. It's not a wishful thinking, I hope it happens, but it probably won't. It's a, I can't wait till God fulfills this promise. It's a confident expectation of what is to come. That's what Paul means by hope. So I can rejoice in a confident expectation that God will keep his promise. That's what Paul is saying here. We rejoice and the hope of what is to come, not what is. That's always been the sign, the symbol, the banner of a Christian in this world. They rejoice in what is to come, not in what is. They hope in what is to come, not in what is. My hope is not in this world. Paul said, if I hope in Christ, if it's only in this life, I'm of all men most miserable. No, I'm hoping for the eternal fulfillment of what Christ has given me. So Colossians 3, 1 through 4, I'm going to read that. Look at what it says here. If then you have been raised with Christ, if you've been saved, is what he's saying. If you are a born-again believer, if you've been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You see that? And the reason that many professing Christians have no biblical joy is because Christ is not their life. You see, see the, the, the key to this verse is, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who now is your life, appears, are you longing for that? Are you, is, is Christ your life? Paul said to live is Christ. To live is Christ. To live a daily life in this world is all about Jesus. That's why I am alive, to bring him glory. And if I die, that's gain, because I'm with him. Therefore, joy cannot be taken away despite any circumstance we go through. In, in spite of any circumstance, our joy is anchored in the hope of God's eschatological promise of the fulfillment of my salvation that I will tangibly see and actually become. I will become as Christ in the sense of my glorified body. This same Jesus, which we see leaving, the angels say, will come again and we will be like him, glorified in a resurrected body. I mean, this, folks, this again, this is our problem. We're so busy with our focus on CNN and Fox News and everything else in this life that we are not setting our affections and looking above we're looking below. We're looking at this earth. We have got to be eschatological. Folks, I know we joke about es eschatology. By the way, what is eschatology? It's, it's the doctrine of end time events. It's the idea, the study of end times. When is Jesus coming? Who's the Antichrist? What's the mark of the beast? You know, we get, some people get really carried away with certain parts of this thing of eschatology. 
And we joke, we, we, we don't joke, it's true that eschatology is not essential in some ways. It, it doesn't matter what you believe about eschatology, if, if you're amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial, right? Don't even ask. But <laughs> if you don't know, just different views of, of what all these things are going to happen, right? Like, like, like so forth. But, here, but here's the thing none of that affects your salvation. So whether you're a post-millennial or amillennial or optimistic all, like myself, or pre-millennial, none of that affects your salvation, but it is important. You need to know what you believe about the end times. Why? Because it affects how you live now. Your eschatology, what you believe about how Christ returns, what it means to be in his kingdom, what you believe about those things will affect how you live now. And Paul's showing us that here. He's saying, whether or not you have joy that lasts through the pain and the suffering of this world will be determined by what you really believe about my promises to come again and receive you to myself, to glorify you, and for you to live with me forever in glory. What do you believe about that? That will determine how you live now. First, and, 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 and so, so what I'm saying with all this, we need to be people who think about these things because that is our hope. Our, our joy is anchored in the hope that God meant what he said. When he said, I am preparing a place for you, I'm coming to receive you, and you will be with me forever. We got to believe those things. We believe that Jesus said, don't worry, don't store up treasures on this earth. Store up treasures in heaven. That's your eternity. So we need to be thinking this way. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6 is one of those promises, one of those places where our hope is anchored. And this is why we can have joy no matter what happens in this life. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, is he your Lord and Savior? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? Is he your King? That's who this is written to. And these are the only people who can have biblical joy. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. To what? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see all of that eschatology. The reason we have hope is because Christ has risen from the dead. And that means we will, too, be risen from the dead. He goes on, what are we saved to? This living hope, he goes on to say, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the what last time? It simply means our salvation is going to be made crystal clear and real, literally. Right now, we know we're saved by faith. We believe what God tells us in his word. He did for us through Christ. He took our sins. He gave us his righteousness. And we are being saved. We are being sanctified in this life. But one day, we will inherit all of it. Why? We're being kept by God for this salvation that will be revealed in that last time. In this you rejoice. You see it? This is it. This is the formula. We have joy in hope that God keeps these promises. In this you rejoice. And here it is. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. There's it, there it is, folks. In this world, you will have trouble. And yet there's victory. That's, 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 that is the motto of the Christian. In this world, we have pain. In this world, we have trouble. But we are victorious in Christ. And we long for those things that God has promised us. And we have confident expectation that they will happen. Therefore, I can have joy. Real joy. And I can rejoice in the midst of anything. Now, that's the first dimension. So what Paul is saying is, 
for the Christian, you're living life and these dimensions, they intertwine. But one of the things the Christian will be doing is you will be rejoicing and you will be living a joyful life because of your hope. That's one thing that we do. But then the second dimension, let's read the verse again, verse 12, 12. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation. So that second dimension is patience and tribulation. They're different, right? Rejoice! You have great hope! Suffer and be patient. <laughs> oh my. But they're both part of the Christian life. Don't let anybody tell you that if you're a Christian, you're, all, you're only going to live a life of rejoicing, rejoicing, and all things are good, and all things are always good, and if everything's bad, then that's God. He's not blessing you. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. It says we will rejoice, but we will also patiently endure tribulation, and that is all normal for the Christian. I mean, if you're older than two years old, you know that the world is full of tribulation. They say, why? I watch my two-year-old. She goes, things happen. Tribulation. Lost her dinosaur. Tribulation. <laughs> I mean, wah! We couldn't find We had to look up, my dinosaur. Wah! And, and, and I know that you laugh, but to her, that's real. And, I, and it is real, right? That, my point is, from the time we're like two or three old enough to understand what's happening, we realize there's disappointment, there's pain, there's loss. So that's, that's real, folks. John 16, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Do you see the mix, the tribulation, and then the hope? The mix in, of, hey, there's tribulation, there's pain, there's suffering. But rejoice in the hope, the truth, the confidence that I have overcome. <laughs> that, that's the balance of the Christian life, right? Those two dimensions, we're always living in that. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 reminds us again, hey, it's normal to suffer as a Christian. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Maybe this will encourage somebody that seems to be going through a trial after trial. You wonder, does God love me? Am I a Christian? Am I, am I saved? Now, some theologies would say must not be because if you were saved, that would never happen. But that's not what the Bible says. Peter's telling us and, and encouraging us, don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, when you are going through suffering and trials. It's not strange. It's not a strange thing happening to you. But he, but he goes on to say what? But rejoice. You see that pattern all through the Bible now? You've got these moments of rejoicing and the moments of suffering, but they're intertwined. And even in the midst of fiery trials and suffering, rejoice. Why? Insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You see it again, the pattern? Eschatological hope. What gets me through the suffering of this world and causes me to have joy to continue living day to day for the glory of God is the fact that his glory will be revealed. It's his promise. And that's my hope. And that brings me joy in the midst of suffering. Third dimension is this. So, so again, the first dimension, rejoice in hope. That's where we're living. We, we, we are rejoicing in the hope of what Christ has done for us and what he will do for us. But we're also living in this dimension of patient tribulation. We suffer loss, pain, hurt, all those things. And yet, there's this third dimension. Look what it says. Rejoice, again, verse 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And that prayer is the glue that holds everything together here, right? The, 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 I, I, am in, I am to be constant in prayer when I'm rejoicing and things are wonderful. I'm to be constant in prayer when I am facing tribulation. That prayer, that's, that's the dimension whereby we should be living the other dimensions. I, I know it's getting crazy. How many dimensions are there? Don't worry. <laughs> I... I hope you get my point here. There, there's different aspects of our life, right? We're going to be suffering. We're going to be rejoicing, sometimes on the same day. Sometimes you'll leave, you'll get a call. Hey, the, 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 hey there's this beautiful grandbaby's been born. You, you go visit them in the hospital. 
And then you get a call that a dear friend has just died. And you go visit that family and you mourn with them. You see what I'm saying? So in life, life, that's, that's life, right? That's why Paul is saying we must be constant in prayer. It's prayer. It's prayer that connects the Christian to the very promises of God. It's prayer that shows our reliance upon the grace of God and mercy of God. We can't get through this life on our own, so we pray. And when we pray, we're calling out to God, help me, sustain me, I trust you, I rejoice in you. That's what prayer is. It is it's to be done constantly. I mean, literally. I mean, Prayer is basically saying, and here's, here's, I know we get worried about prayer and we're afraid to pray in public or we're afraid to, we think it's some, some ritualistic um, thing that we have to be good at and study. Folks, prayer is simply saying to God, I rely totally on you. I need you. That's it. Do you rely totally on God and his grace and his mercy and his wisdom and his knowledge? I mean, prayer... 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it's a very short verse, but again, it's so powerful. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That's what, that's, what, that's what he just said in verse 12. Be constant in prayer. So praying for the Christian should be as natural as breathing. It takes away this superstitious idea, this, this idea that this some, some strange ritual that I have to practice and get good at. No, prayer is like breathing for the Christian. It, it, it's a quiet, ever-present conversation with God concerning his character and his promises. You're constantly breathing out prayers to God. It's, it, so, so I encourage you as a Christian, begin to do this. Yes, there'll be times when we have more formal prayer times when you get up and you, if you want to kneel by your bed or, or at the kitchen table, uh, wherever, but a, a time where you're really saying, good morning, Lord, I, I love you, and you're praying back his psalms to him, and you're, you're, you're praying with, for requests and all these things. There's times for that. But when you're driving down I-75 late for work, that's not the time <laughs> to, to be head bowed and eyes closed, <laughs> right? But it is nonetheless time to pray. This is the point. Prayer is a never-ending, never-ceasing conversation with my Heavenly Father. Why? Because I rely on Him totally. I am constantly just breathing out prayers to Him. I'm constantly in communication with Him. That's how, that's how simple prayer is. Literally. I mean, from the big, in-depth, Lord, should I take this job and move my family across the country? Lord, what's your will? That's a big, deep prayer. It takes a lot of prayer and fasting and so forth, as the Bible says. So from that kind of prayer to the prayer at the intersection, Lord, change this light. I'm just saying. But, and we laugh. We can laugh at that. But folks, the, the literal thing is that what that shows is that I am constantly in communication with my Father. He is literally real. He's with me. His Spirit abides in me. And I can talk to him and I rely on him. So I rely on him when I'm going to that meeting and I'm not sure what I'm going to say and I'm meeting with all these different uh, employees and I have to somehow correct some and whatever is going on, I'm just throwing all this out. But here's the point about that. As I'm walking into that room, I'm praying, God, give me grace, give me calm, give me wisdom. What am I saying in that quick little prayer? God, I'm relying on you and not me. That is worshiping God that is exalting God, and that is setting my priorities right. All in a simple breath, constantly praying. Folks, we should be constantly relying on God as, as his people. We have to. We have no one else to rely on. And so what Paul is saying is when I am constant in prayer, I will be praying when I rejoice and things are well. I'm going to be praying when things are bad. Prayer should not be something strange. Our kids should not look at us and say, wow, mom and dad are praying. Something must be up. Something big must be going on, mom. And no, it should be part of our life, part of our lifestyle. I mean, Matthew 26, 41. Jesus said, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. That's another reason I'm constantly praying. God, give me grace. Give me victory over my sin. 
Don't let me do this. Don't let me think that. Forgive me. Just, just constant, constant breaths that are coming out of us. I mean, if you're driving down the road and you see a billboard and you lust, you don't put a note and say, I need to pray about this when I get home tonight at 10 o'clock from work. No, you do it right there. Father, forgive me. I don't want to do that. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, got, to, it's got to be a daily, moment-by-moment moment part of our life. This prayer communication with my Heavenly Father. But here's the problem. Jesus knows us, and he said, the last part of that verse, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's why we need prayer. Our flesh is weak. We must continually cry out to God, Father, by your spirit, give me grace to honor you in my conversations, in my relationships, how I work, in all that I do. And very quickly, just closing here, David models this for us, this prayer, this kind of prayer. And these three dimensions that we see, we see in David's prayer in the Psalms, in, in Psalm 13, 1 through 6. So again, if you, if you don't know how to pray, read this Psalm. Pray this Psalm. We've all prayed this to some extent, folks. You're going to see that all of us are not that different. From, from the great heroes of the Bible, we realize they're just human flesh, just like us, who need a Savior, and who God has provided by His Spirit the ability to live a life that glorifies Him. That's grace. But here it is. Look at this simple prayer. What did David pray? Verse 1, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? It's okay to say that, by the way. God, are you there? Lord, why is this happening? I mean, those kind of things. We can say those things. That's what David said. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. So what we see here in David is great depression, great brokenness, great misery, despair. At the end of his rope, and it's okay to say, God, I'm at the end of my rope. Matter of fact, we must say that several times a day if we're honest. Lord, I don't know what to do here. I need your grace. I'm relying on you. Forgive me on and on and on. So yes, it's okay. I have in, uh, th this person's against me. This person lied about me. On and on. That's what David is showing here. Just life and the, and the tribulation. And he's being patient in it because he, he prays on and on. Lord, I am broken. I need you. How long, Lord? How long? Will you forget me forever? So David is showing signs here that he has suffered quite a time. Quite a length of time. And yet, look at the same prayer. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. There's a model for us to pray. Even though I'm hurting God, I can still rejoice in the hope that you keep your promises, the, the confidence that everything you said will come to pass so I can rejoice. When we pray that way, God, he, he, he fulfills his promise to never leave us nor forsake us. He fulfills the promise that by his spirit we can do all things through Christ. And we can glorify him as we long to see him face to face. May we be people of prayer. Now, having said that, one of the things that we do now as a church as we come together as communion is we remind each other, again, of the faithfulness of God. One way of looking at faith and hope, and that's what we see in Hebrews, these three remain faith, hope, and love, right? So these are big parts of the Christian life. One way to think about faith, though, faith looks back to what Christ has done Fulfilling the promises of God of the Old Testament, he, he, he did come, he lived a perfect life, he died on the cross, he was buried and rose again. So faith looks back at what Christ has done, and I, by faith, believe that God has done that. Hope looks forward with great confidence to what he will do, what he has promised to do. 
And in communion, we see both. We see as Jesus took that bread, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. We, we, we now look back to that, folks, by faith. We believe that. If, if we are Christians, if we're saved, we are putting our faith in this, that Christ died on a cross to bear my sin, my wickedness. He shed his blood. He said, this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is what washes away your sin. So we look back, and by faith, we believe that. But then also, what did Jesus say? He said, as often as you do this, you show the Lord's death until he comes. There's that promise, that hope. He's coming again. And this is what we profess. This is, this is where our hope is, folks. And as a church, we celebrate this together. So I invite you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you believe that this was done for you on the cross. You also believe the promises that he's coming again. All of those who believe that, all those who love the church, I invite you to come. Receive, remember, and rejoice in what Christ has done and what he will do for you.